All right, so I will now give it to Sarah. She's studying the first block. And, cool. um, and um, Emma is going to uh, monitor the chat box. And I will uh, take care of Hannah now that she can come on as well. Yeah, I think she's still having some problems. Yeah, yeah, I, we, will, we will figure it out. I'm just going to turn off my video and then you just take it from there for now for the All next right, 30 minutes. All right, sounds great. All right, thanks. All right, good morning, everyone. I know you can't respond to me, but that's okay. Let me see if I can figure out here how to share the screen. Okay. Perfect. And there we go. Okay. I can't see any chat questions, I don't think. So, Emma, if something comes up, um, you guys can interrupt me or you can just ask them at the end. Um, either way is fine. Okay, guys. So, I'm uh, Dr. Sarah Villani. Sarah, um, the plant pathologist at NC State that works with apples, stone fruit, grapes, and cane berries, particularly raspberries. Okay, so today I'm going to start out with Pierce's disease update, um, our symptoms, imposters, and diagnosing Pierce's disease out in the vineyard and also in the lab. All right, so let's go ahead and all plant pathologists love to look at disease cycles. So I'm just going to start out today with one and then we can forget about disease cycles throughout the rest of this presentation, if you will. All right, but as you know, Pierce's disease is a xylem um, limited bacteria, which means it, can, it hangs out in the xylem and you really need a vector of sorts, an insect, in order to transmit it. So your vector of choice, and Hannah will talk about this a little bit later on, will actually suck the bacterium out of the xylem as it's feeding. And what's interesting about a lot of these different vectors of Pierce's disease is that they can actually retain and propagate this bacterium, xylella fastidiosa, inside of its foregut. And this is important because it remains, it means that the titer of the bacteria can remain high. And also since it's in the foregut, it can also pop it out and inject it into plants as it goes along and it feeds. If you have any problems hearing me, just let me know and Emma can, can speak up as well and just let me know. I had some complaints the other day that my microphone was going in and out. Okay, so from there, the um, insect, in this case, it would be a sharpshooter, would go ahead and feed on healthy plants or any plants in that case. As the season progresses, you might start to see symptoms of chlorosis or intervenal necrosis, as you see here, particularly at, let's say, a basal leaf end. And then as we get toward the mid to end of the summer, you'll start to see more of your um, diagnostic symptoms of Pierce's disease, including those necrotic leaf margins, as you see here. And you know, if the insect vector is available, then this uh, cycle can continue throughout the rest of the season. What I'll say about the insect vector is that it's two things are really important about it. First of all, it can only really feed and get the virus or it can only really acquire the virus, I should say, or excuse me, the bacterium, not the virus, if the titer of the bacterium is high. So basically, if you do not have a high inoculum or a high bacterial population, this vector is not going to acquire the Pierce's disease pathogen, okay? And second of all, um, this also has to be flying when the titer is high as well. So just keep that in mind. Okay, so how does Pierce's disease affect the grapevine? Well, in many ways, but it's essentially plugging up the pipes. And this can happen in two ways. So first of all, this is a um, electron scanning microscope picture, microscopy picture of xylem cells here. And in the close-up here, you can see that this is the Pierce's disease pathogen, xylella fastidiosa, actually plugging up the xylem cells right here. Okay, another way um, that it can affect um, the, the grapevine and, and mimic drought conditions is that the grapevine actually um, sets off a defense. So these are host defense mechanisms and it barricades the bacterium so that it cannot move throughout the grapevine. So basically, since this is a xylem um, limited bacteria and it hangs out in the xylem, what it does, the plant, is it actually puts up these walls called tyloses, these gummy-like structures that prevent the pathogen from moving back and forth. The problem with this is simply that if it plugs up the xylem cells, then of course it's going to stop water and nutrient flow as well from the ground up to your top leaves. And Hannah's on. Hey, Hannah, good to see you. Okay. 
So let's talk about two different uh, types of infections um, that are associated with Pierce's disease. Okay, we have local infections and systemic infections. Okay, local infections occur near and around the area in which the infection was introduced or which the bacteria was introduced by that vector. And those are most often um, visible and present, those symptoms, during a single growing season. Okay. Once you move on that, that season in which the plant or the grapevine was infected by the, the bacteria, then we start to get into systemic infections throughout that following year. And this occurs when those bacteria are moving through the xylem and also reproducing inside the vine. Once the systemic phase hits, this infection is going to be present for many seasons. Usually it can only be two sometimes because the vine will die by then and it likely persists forever or like I said, until the vine dies, which can often happen if uh, climatic conditions are, are uh, right for it within a year or two. So the disease can kill a, a grapevine pretty quickly. So let's talk about diagnosing um, Pierce's disease in the field, and let's talk about looking at symptoms of it. Okay, I just want to go out first and say, um, it really depends, the symptoms which are expressed are really going to depend on the infection timing. Okay, is this a current year symptoms or those local symptoms versus previous year symptoms, in which we call those sy systemic symptoms. As you are probably aware, those who have dealt with Pierce's disease before, Okay, it's going to resemble several other diseases or abiotic disorders. And so what I would say to you is that don't zero in on a single symptom when diagnosing Pierce's disease in the field. Okay, there are four main symptoms that we're going to talk about um, that, that are, are characteristic of those local infections. So we wanna look for all four of those or at least a few of those symptoms. And we also wanna consider the cultivar that's at play here and the environment and the timing in which these symptoms show up, okay? So for example, if you're seeing symptoms in May, we're gonna learn, or April, it most likely may not be Pierce's disease as those usually show up later in the season. Furthermore, many um, cultivars, as Mark will talk about later, and I'll touch on um, early on in this presentation or a little bit later on in this presentation, are tolerant or are not very susceptible to this bacterial disease. And so you want to consider the cultivar as well. And one other thing to keep in mind, that if you jump the gun and try to diagnose Pierce's disease around May, June, as I mentioned, you might be wrong. And it's likely either a virus or an abiotic disorder um, that you're dealing with. Okay, so the, the symptoms that you see in the field become more dependable for diagnosing this disease um, later in the summer and early into the autumn, I would say. Okay. And then the appearance of symptoms, the rate at which they occur and how they're expressed are going to depend on a number of factors. Climate, how hot is it? How cold is it? Is it dry year? Has it been really wet? Okay, different cultivars, whether they're, you know, especially if they're red versus white, are going to express symptoms differently. Often more susceptible cultivars, you're going to see more severe infections associated with it. And of course, the timing of the infection. Is the plant being infected in April or May early on, or is it a later season infection, such as July or August? So certainly the first symptoms that gets everyone running, including myself, and their hands up in the air, are these leaf scorch symptoms, okay? And why? These are usually the first symptoms to appear, and they're usually the most noticeable if you're going by spraying, scouting the vineyard, et cetera, okay? So we're gonna look here at a white cultivar, from midsummer through late summer until autumn. And so with midsummer, we're starting to talk about right around this time. I would say maybe a few weeks later than now around mid-July. And you can see that the leaf is becoming chlorotic at the margins. And also, um, as we move on, that chlorosis of the leaf turns out, turns into this dead tissue, which is necrosis, and it continues to progress. Okay, the symptoms do not stop, the symptoms do not improve. All right, as we go forward. Um, with red uh, cultivars or red varieties, these are a little bit more striking to me and they actually tend to look more viral um, in my opinion here. Often with the red cultivars, you'll see a red margin or a purplish margin um, on the inside of the um, advancing necrosis. 
Okay, so again, midsummer, late summer, and into autumn here. Okay. If there's any questions, just go ahead and ask. Okay. Sometimes you don't get this beautiful progression though. Plants are not nice to us. So one thing I'd like to oops, point out here is that sometimes you don't even see that, that necrosis. You go right from, or sorry, that chlorosis, you go right from healthy looking leaf, you spray one week, you're coming back out to put on another fungicide application, and oh man, I've got necrosis all around my leaf margins here. Or sometimes you'll see injury on only part, this irregular type of injury um, or necrosis on the leaf. And you might think, what did I do now? Is that spray damage, that nutrient deficiency, or so forth? Okay, so what I would suggest is, you know, think about the symptoms here. Usually, you know, you'll see um, the distribution throughout the cane or throughout the vine on one to two canes. Um, this might be more severe in younger susceptible vines. You know, if it's something like spray injury you think could be causing an issue, you would see that probably more throughout the entire vine and distributed more throughout that. Same with abiotics um, or nutrient deficiencies as well. Okay, so usually, unless you have a highly susceptible um, cultivar or it's very young, you'll see these symptoms starting out um, on your first few canes. One of the more characteristic symptoms of uh, Pierce's disease, which you'll have to look a bit closer, um, are these matchstick symptoms here, or where the petiole remains attached to the shoot, as you see right here, or as you can see here and here as well. Okay, now this is most likely a symptom that if you're driving by quickly or you're focusing on spraying, you're not going to see that first. And this usually comes in this symptom a little bit later um, than that leaf necrosis as well. But these matchstick signs are very rare in other abiotic dis um, disorders, in drought stress, um, or in other plant diseases as well. Okay, so definitely look for those matchstick symptoms. Usually, we'll talk about it a little bit later, but if you have drought stress, you usually see areas of abscission on the petiole, both at the stem uh, petiole junction, as well as at the leaf petiole junction. Okay, with Pierce's disease, that area of necrosis um, and abscission usually just comes at that petiole leaf junction, as you see there. Okay. One other symptom that I'd like to just mention right here, um, that's not necessarily a matchstick, but it's important to look at is look at the colored veins. This was taken in a greenhouse, this photo, so it's particularly um, obvious. But you can see here that the veins of the leaves are black. Often in drought stress, they're not going to turn that color black. And this black is really the pathogen, that xylella pathogen, moving through the vine's plumbing. Okay? okay you're going to want to look. And this, this um, symptom, I would say, is probably the least obvious for me to diagnose. And usually, you know, it really can come or go, um, or can be there or not be there, I should say, um, with Pierce's disease. But these are the green islands. Okay, so really what you have is this irregular maturation or lignification of infected shoots producing these green islands. I'll tell you now that, the, that these green islands, the production of these is very dependent on um, water stress or how much the weather, right? How much it's raining, rainfall or moisture, right? And so usually if you've got a fairly moderate year with rainfall or a wet year, these green islands are more likely to be um, observed than not. Just because you don't see green islands doesn't mean you should discount Pierce's disease. Okay, so keep that in mind. And then lastly, um, in late summer, um, autumn, um, certainly one of the last uh, symptoms to look for here are these shriveled dry raisin berries. Um, again, this is very diagnostic for a number of uh, grapevine diseases. Okay, we've seen this even with downy mildew, right? So just because you see shriveled up grapevines, um, you can't discount drought stress, you can't discount the virus, you can't discount um, trunk diseases, et cetera. So the bottom line here, I would say, is that really the matchstick appearance is most likely diagnostic. Usually if you're scouting, you're not going to see the matchsticks first. You'll probably see one of the other symptoms, such as the dried berries or certainly the leaves. And really you need to look at the vine as a whole and the symptoms as a whole complex, rather than just narrowing in on one of these, um, one of these characteristics of Pierce's disease. Okay. So now let's go ahead and move on to what happens with a chronic infection. Okay, so we had infection, right? 
um, in year one of the bacterium. Now, what happens the following year, okay? If your vine is systemically infected with Xylella fastidiosa, around early to mid spring, you might see some delayed shoot growth in stunting. As you can see here, this is a vine that's not infected with Pierce's disease versus a vine that is infected. And you can see here that shoot development is much more delayed and stunted compared to the uninfected vine next to it. Okay. Usually out in California, they're around two weeks behind um, non-PD infected vines and shoots. Again, this is going to depend on climate and uh, the water status of the vine. Around the mid spring timing, okay, my suggestion would be to look at the first four to eight leaves toward the basal end of the shoot or toward the bottom of the shoot here, not the top. Okay, what you'll start to see if your vein, if your vine, excuse me, is um, systemically infected, you'll start to see this intervenal chlorosis. Sometimes you'll see dimpling of the leaves, like you see here. They'll be stunted, misshapen. Again, all of these symptoms, though, are very similar to what a vine might look like if it's infected with the virus. Okay, so I would say that systemic infections are much tougher to diagnose than those localized infections are. And then as we move on throughout the year, on that second year of infection from late spring to midsummer, right around this time or prior, you'll definitely start to see a sparse canopy, um, leaf scorching, particularly in these basal leaves closer to the shoot base. And most often they'll progress toward the tips. Okay, that's not always the truth, xylem, these bacteria can move back and forth through the xylem and so forth against it or with it. Um, but usually you'll see the necrosis and the depth of the leaves progressing toward the distal end or the, the shoot tip. So let's go ahead now and take a look. Just, you know, those are great photos that I got from a publication. But let's take a look at some of the cases here in North Carolina. All right, so how prevalent is Pierce's disease? Well, in North Carolina, well, if we look at the plant disease and insect clinic here, um, I don't know if it completely tells the tale or not. We didn't have Mark out there scouting and you really didn't have a great pathologist until recently. So Hannah was a one woman show for a while um, before Mark's arrival, I would say, and before I was moved over um, to work on grapes. Um, but there were 23 submissions to our disease and insect clinic uh, for Pierce's disease or suspected Pierce's disease from 2017 to 2020, okay? We might've received one, I think, uh, this year, okay? And this is the months in which they were received, June, July, August, and October. And all I wanted to point out here was that when samples were taken in June or October, there was a greater chance of those become, being negative um, for Pierce's disease, particularly in June. Yes, it's a small sample size to work with, um, but you get the idea that most of the symptoms were showing up, as I mentioned earlier, from July through um, early October. And since Mark was the one collecting the majority of these or extension agents um, who were well-versed on Pierce's disease and grape diseases, um, most of them were positive for Pierce's disease during those months there. Okay. So I was gonna play a game, but I guess you guys can't talk. So let's go ahead and uh, take a look at some of the um, photos that were submitted to the disease and insect clinic. And let's see if we can identify some of those um, um, symptoms of Pierce's disease. Okay, so I'll raise my own hand since you guys can't really do it out there. And the first symptom that I obviously see here, this was submitted by Karen Blado from Henderson County at the end of August of last year, is certainly this advancing necrosis of leaves, particularly toward the bottom end of the vine. That's the most obvious symptom. But with Karen's excellent um, keen eye and photography skills, you can also see that she was able to take photographs of these matchsticks, as you see here and even up here. Those matchsticks, like I mentioned, are probably the most telltale sign of Pierce's disease of grapevines. Here are some easy ones, but I just wanted you to get a glimpse of those. Um, these are all, I believe, on red cultivars up uh, Petit uh, Verdot and Malbec right here. And you can see the advancing necrosis. You can see, sort of see these red margins here um, and so forth. But both of these samples submitted in October of 2018 tested positive for Pierce's disease. Okay. 
And again here, submitted in 2018 at the end of July, once again, you can see um, the necrosis and the red margin on the leaf margins right there. Okie dokes. One thing I do want to point out um, that we'll talk about a little bit later, as you can see on these samples here, the petiole was attached. The petiole, as you'll learn, is going to be very important for the ELISA lab diagnostic assays that we'll be running. Okay, this sample, Mark might have even taken uh, this photograph here. Um, sorry, Mark, I got it from the disease clinic and from um, one of the agents out in Wilkes County or Ireland County that was submitted at the end of uh, July of 2018. And this was a fantastic photo to show several symptoms of Pierce's disease. Okay, the first thing to point out, certainly those um, necrotic leaves and those necrotic leaf margins, okay, at different stages. Secondly, they were able to capture those matchsticks, the petiole stuck to the, uh, to the shoot. And then lastly, you can even see some of the clusters of the berries. They're starting to become dry and shriveled up due to the lack of nutrition and also the lack of water um, to keep those berries turgid. Okay, I think this might be the last one here, but I could be lying. I just wanted to get another glimpse for you of the uh, dried raisin berries as you see in these photos submitted from 2017 on Capsol. Okay. This was confirmed as Pierce's disease um, on this vine. They might have also had some trunk issues. This looks very um, much like a trunk disease as well on the leaf. Okay. Next, I want to look at, be on the lookout for some of the imposters, and these get me every time. Okay, if we could be live and in a room right now, um, I would ask you uh, which side of this cab franc has Pierce's disease. And then hopefully in my make-believe world before COVID, you would say the, the vine on the left has Pierce's disease. And I'd say you're right. Good job. Okay. So anyway, many, um, many, we, or, sorry, many, many viruses, this is red blotch on cab franc, can present like Pierce's disease. Um, one thing that I would um, suggest you look for in a virus compared to Pierce's disease, if you're trying to do some quick diagnostics in the field, is that necrosis. Most often, we'll see necrosis on Pierce's disease, where on most viruses, according to my friend Libby, who's a virologist at Clemson and also was Mark Fuchs's graduate student at Cornell University, most of the time with viruses, we are not going to see that necrosis. Doesn't mean it doesn't happen. It just means that it's more common and more rapid with Pierce's disease than it would be for something like red blotch. And you can also see here that the margins seem to be more defined for Pierce's disease on the leaf margins compared to that of red blotch on the right there. Okay. One that gets me every time also are these grapevine trunk diseases, particularly if we're only looking at leaf symptoms or berry symptoms. That's why I suggested those matchsticks are really important to look for. Okay, so grapevine trunk diseases. Okay, there's many similar symptoms here. You see stunted shoots, leaf chlorosis and scorching, right? Most likely due to um, drought stress and the pathogen actually being systemic within the grapevine. And then shriveled berries, because once again, there's not enough water and nutrients reaching the above ground parts of the plant. The xylem vessels and the vascular tissue are once again plugged up with these wood pathogens as well. What I would say to look for is look for matchsticks, okay, when it comes to trying to differentiate between grapevine trunk diseases and Pierce's disease. So look for matchsticks. Look for those green islands, although I said eh, they're sometimes hard to see. Um, one thing to look for that can be quite diagnostic is if you can get, you can clip in or cut into your cuttings there, you'll often see a V shaped wedge from where the pathogen entered through a pruning wound and in through the vascular tissue um, into the heartwood of the plant. Okay, so you can cut open the vine and look for that. Pierce's disease often won't have any wedges associated with it. Okay. And then of course, abiotic stressors, right? Several nutrient deficiencies, um, phosphorus deficiencies, magnesium deficiencies, salt toxicity, particularly if you live near a coastal area, um, you'll start to see very similar symptoms on the leaves um, to Pierce's disease. Drought stress as well. 
And general stress might look quite like Pierce's disease because as we know, Pierce's disease blocks up the xylem vessels, which then blocks up the water flow in the plant. So they can very often mimic each other. One thing I just wanna show, and I'm not going to get into too many research on the subjects today from other studies, but I just wanted to point out, um, you know, one, a research group, Thorne et al. in 20, 2006, actually wanted to better understand water deficit symptoms versus Pierce's disease symptoms. And so what they did is they did three different watering regimes, um, water deficit, regular water, and overwatered um, without infecting grapevines. And then what they did is they did the same watering regime, but then they inoculated the grapevines with the Pierce's disease bacterium, Xylella. And this was done in a greenhouse. And they took photos of symptoms. One thing they found was that with Pierce's disease, green islands usually form, but not always. And you always saw this area, this fracture area um, at the leaf petiole junction. Whereas with water stress vines that were not infected with Pierce's disease, oftentimes, like I mentioned earlier, you would not see any green islands. You'd have two zones of abscission, one near the petiole stem junction, one near the petiole leaf junction. And then if you look here, most of the time you did not see any blackening of those leaf veins compared to Pierce's disease. Moving on, factors determining transition from local to systemic infection, and this is important. If you have a local infection, often it means that your plant is not yet doomed, and there's still time for an act or a miracle to happen uh, so that you don't go to systemic and so that your plant or your vine doesn't die, okay? So the first factor to, that determines that transition from a local to systemic infection is the timing of the infection. And these spring timings, okay, when the vine is infected in the spring, it's much more likely to become systemic compared to later season infections. And we'll look into that in a moment. Okay, the second is winter temperatures. And as we know here, we know this, that lower temperatures in the winter aid in vine recovery or vine curing, you might have heard it called, from Pierce's disease. And then lastly, the host variety and the species. And Mark will get into this a little bit further, but certainly um, we have got very tolerant um, grapevines for most, mu most muscadines and several hybrids, all the way to the highly susceptible varieties like Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, and so forth. Okay, mostly in these tolerant or less susceptible varieties here, if it does become infected, the vine is much more likely to stay localized rather than become systemic throughout the vine. Um, so here's a study where they, where some Reed file et al. in 2003 um, was curious about, you know, what happens if my vine is infected early versus what happens if it's infected later in the season? And pet, what does that mean in terms of vine recovery? And so if you see here on the y-axis, we have percent recovery months in which uh, the vines were inoculated. And really, any time an infection happened, at June or afterwards, the infection really didn't seem to go systemic and the vines were cured or recovered in cold areas. Whereas when we had these um, early infections here, that gave the, the bacteria more time to spread, okay, become systemic starting later in the season and um, establish itself more. And we had much less of chance of recovery at that point, okay? Furthermore, why are we talking about Pierce's disease today? And you know, is it really becoming a greater threat in North Carolina? And the answer is yes. And why is that? Because really we're getting warmer as the years go on, right? And, and we know this based on looking at minimum temperatures throughout the, win the winter. So what uh, Sam and Noss did with Turner Sutton is they looked at different regions of North Carolina and they developed um, risk areas or risk temperatures for which a plant might, become, might succumb to systemic infection um, by Pierce's disease here. And they looked at two different minimum temperatures during the winter months as a guide, either a minimum temperature of 10 degrees Fahrenheit or a minimum temperature of 15.1 degrees Fahrenheit, okay? If you only had one day of temperatures at 10 degrees Fahrenheit or below, you had a very high risk of um, your vine not curing um, from Pierce's disease, okay? If you had a moderate risk, 
that meant that you had three plus days of temperatures above 10 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, same thing with the 15.1 degree threshold. Basically here they looked at, okay, if I had three days at 15.1 or less, yes, or, or greater, I should say, um, what would happen is you'd be at a very high risk for Pierce's disease um, becoming systemic. Whereas if you had five or more days of 15.1 degrees Fahrenheit um, or less during the winter, you were at moderate, moderate risk in North Carolina for succumbing to the disease. The basic um, um, take home message here is that from 2000 to 2009, uh, we had uh, seven years at higher, very high risk um, using the 10 degree threshold. And from 2010 to 2019, we had eight years um, of very high or high risk. Looking at the higher minimum temperature, we actually doubled the risk of years between 2009 and, 2000 and 2009 and 2010 to 2019. So our risk is getting higher uh, because our winters are becoming warmer here in North Carolina, at least in regards to minimum temperatures. All right, let's go ahead now and move to testing for Pierce's disease. Um, really, there are three options um, when we test for Pierce's. The first is isolation of the pathogen in culture. Okay, so this is, okay, you send somebody a sample and then they need to isolate it and then put it on one of those auger plates that is selective or that can pretty much only grow the xylella pathogen. Okay. These have some uh, benefits. There's really no false positives. The bad thing about this is it's very difficult. It takes a while and it's just not something you can do a lot of samples. It's not a high throughput um, method per, per se. There's a molecular test where we can extract the DNA of the pathogen and we can ID it using polymerase chain reaction and making those gels that you see on a CSI there. I don't even know if CSI is still on anymore. Um, and then identifying sequences, right, um, for the pathogen. Okay, the great thing about this is that it's highly sensitive and it's really accurate, so great. The problem here is that, yeah, it can be expensive and you cannot distinguish between live and dead bacteria. So let's say you cured it, but there's still bacteria. You cured the vine, but there might still be bacteria inside of the vine. Maybe they're dead. Um, PCR will still detect it and say that it's positive. What they're using most often at the clinic is a serological assay. Based on time's sake, I'm not going to show that today. Um, but this is really an antigen antibody test here. And this, like I said, is what the disease clinic is using. Okay, the positives here is that it's inexpensive, a really rapid turnaround time. Um, the negatives here is that, you know, you're at greater risk for false positives, but even more at risk, I would say, for more negatives. The titer has to be uh, sort of high, I would say, in comparison to using a PCR technique. Okay, so you're need, going to need to have or collect tissue that certainly has a high titer of the bacteria or a high population of the bacteria in it in order to get a, uh, a positive result. Okay. So question one, when should I sample for Pierce's disease? Um, okay, using an ELISA assay here, um, you know, like I said, the result depends on your bacterial populations, your titer that's in the sample. So looking here, well, I would suggest you're going to start sampling any time between mid-July and I would say mid-October. Start around the horizon period and continue up until harvest period would be the best time um, to sample. Okay, if you're looking at systemic infections, keep in mind that your bacteria really doesn't tend to move into new growth until um, the midsummer, which is now, which is likely part of the reason why we're getting higher hits or we're getting samples, positive samples in these months. Okay, one other thing to keep in mind is just because you get a negative test, it doesn't mean that the vine isn't infected. So you need to provide a good enough sampling or enough samples um, in order to sort of guess or hit where that bacteria may be, okay, in the vine. Okay, so that brings up the next question is where do I want to sample? Okay, people have done studies looking at leaves, petioles, woody tissue, etc., and they have found um, consistently that the highest population or highest titer of the Pierce's disease uh, bacterium is actually in those petioles. So make sure that those petioles are submitted along with symptomatic leaves. Okay. Um, the next thing is to try to collect symptomatic leaves. 
uh, plus the petiole, as I mentioned. Go for the basal nodes or the ones closest to the base is often the best. Um, you see here stage C, B, and A, this wonderful little diagram. I would suggest trying to focus on some of these uh, lower leaves here. You don't want them completely dead though and crunchy. So make sure there's still some green tissue um, available on those. If there's not, continue to move up the vine. And then really a minimum, minimum sample should consist of three to five leaves plus the petioles. If you're sending these to the, the disease clinic or somewhere else, they'll either confine them or they'll decide which samples are best um, to extract tissue on and run the test on. Um, here's just a little bit more proof of where should I sample. Um, Krell et al. went ahead and looked at different areas on the vine, starting from the most basal nodes and moving upwards, okay, toward the distal or toward the tip of the vine there. And what they found that in almost all cases, except for one, which had a high, high disease pressure there, um, what you can see here is that if you look at this light line, that 0.0, .0 is the most basal node, and this moves outward toward the tip, it's that toward the basal or toward those bottom ends of the shoots, in those petioles is the highest probability of getting a xylella fastidiosa detection. Okay, so don't go picking necessarily from those two tips. Stick toward the bottom. Okay. What should I do with my collected samples? Okay. So if you have a case of Pierce's disease, contact your county extension agent or your NC State grape specialist or your consultant. They can help point you in the right direction. Why do this? Number one, it streamlines the process, makes it a heck of a lot easier for you, and you're paying taxes for us to, um, to help you out. So why not use us, or why not use your county agents? Okay. The other thing is that you get a discount on the diagnostic tests. Um, oftentimes, they're $20 per sample per test if it's submitted by an NC State um, or employee or county agent and so forth. Okay. Sometimes, Mark, Mark might even be able to slip them in for free for you. Okay, so make sure you're contacting somebody. But if you're in the field, don't just throw those leaves on the dashboard of your truck and wait for them to cook. Okay, you're gonna wanna place the samples in a cooler, in a Ziploc bag, well, the samples in a Ziploc bag, in a cooler that contains an ice pack. Okay, it's good to put a paper towel in there. Some people say to moisten it, some don't. Um, I don't know, usually I don't find a need to moisten it. Put the samples in the fridge prior to shipping. You're going to want to fill out a PDIC, Plant Disease and Insect Clinic Submission Form online. Um, if you don't know what the heck I'm talking about, um, your agent should do, be able to help you figure that out. And then you're going to want to mail it the same or the next day to the NC State Plant Disease and Insect Clinic. I should have put here, don't mail it on a Friday. It's not going to get to them until Monday. And we also have reduced hours in the clinic right now, so make sure you're working with either somebody on the grape team here or your extension agent to better time things. If you're not familiar with our clinic, I'm just gonna go ahead right now, because why not? Although this probably, I don't know if that's sharing or not. So anyway, there's the link. You can follow this link. It's just gonna make it easier. Um, so follow that link and you can get to um, submission forms um, and so forth for the clinic and read what they're about there. All right, my time is done. Um, thank you for listening. I hope you were listening. I don't know. I can't, I can't see you guys to gauge your interest. Um, but with that, I'll go ahead and I'll take any questions. Yes, yeah, Sarah, we had um, just one question from Kyle Friedman. Um, mm -hmm. He asked, can you bacterial stream canes or shoots infected with Pierce's disease for confirmation of a bacterial infection to better diagnose? Yeah, that's a really good question. I haven't tried it myself because that's, I usually fail with bacterial streaming pretty good. I would suggest that you could go ahead and you might be able to see it, sure. Um, but I would, if the absence of it, I wouldn't let it deter you from sending in a sample. Okay, usually the titer has to be pretty high. But yes, if you can get into that xylem tissue and cut through, I would imagine that bacterial streaming would work, although I haven't seen um, many references to that. Um, yeah. Mark also mentioned you can have mixed infections of Pierce's disease and virus. You certainly can. You can also have mixed infections of Pierce's disease and trunk diseases as well. It gets really, really tough. 
Yeah, that makes it tough to identify the symptoms very, very easily in the, in the field, especially at this time of the year. It does. And, yeah. you know, I've seen a lot of June as I was looking back through the, the clinic submissions as I was coming up with this PowerPoint here. Um, you know, I saw a lot of June submissions that were looking very viral-like. However, we know that the titer's not going to be that high in June, so there could have been Pierce's disease in those as well. Um, we just wouldn't be able to detect it via ELISA, again, because the titer bacterial population just wasn't enough. You really want to wait until mid-July, even if you're itching to know. Um, your money is better spent waiting on this. Yeah, I agree. If, if you... And I'm going to talk about this a little bit later. Um, if you see symptoms now and you think it's Pierce's disease, it makes sense to mark those wines, but I would not send them for testing right now. I would wait a little bit. Good point, Mark. Thanks. Okay. All right. Cool. So, All right. I'm going to shut up. I'm going to be on, though, if any questions come up later. Okay. So I just want to encourage everybody to ask questions in the Q&A box or in the, in the chat box, wherever you prefer to do it. We monitor both. And with this, I give it to Hannah. All right, I am getting my screen share up and running. Okay, um, so can you all hear me all right? Yep. Excellent. Um, so I'm gonna be focusing on vector biology and management here in North Carolina. And I really wanna emphasize that I'm talking about North Carolina specific vector biology. This is going to be different in other states in the US. It's also gonna be different um, in other parts of the Southeast. So not just uh, California versus North Carolina, but also Georgia, Florida, Virginia versus North Carolina. So please keep that in mind um, for those of you who may or may not be um, directly in North Carolina. All right, and I just wanna do a quick little vocabulary recap before we move forward. Um, so when we talk about hosts for Pierce's disease, we are talking about the plants that those that this pathogen will infect. And as has already been highlighted, the host range for Pierce's disease is extremely broad with naturally occurring infections in lots of different plant species, among which are grapes and other woody perennials. The pathogen we're talking about is the, the bacterium Xylella fastidiosa. And then I'm gonna be focusing on vector biology here. And the vector in this case is the insect that moves the pathogen between hosts. So in the case of Pierce's disease, we're talking about insects that feed on the xylem, which is the, the water channels in the plant. And so this is a relatively limited number of our piercing sucking insects, including leafhoppers, spittle bugs, as our potential vector groups. And to reiterate the Pierce's disease life cycle, we're gonna be focusing in on this part here, the leafhopper vector up in the corner, uh, the upper left corner of this illustration. And these xylem feeding leafhoppers, sharpshooters and spittle bugs acquire the bacterium when it's present in a host plant. It adheres to the foregut of that insect and it multiplies within that insect and then is later passed on when they feed on a subsequent host. This is important in particular because that foregut of the insect, and so when I say foregut, I mean the part of the gut that is closest to the mouth, and so analogous to us, that would be our throat, basically. That is shed when the insect molts. So when that insect goes from life stage to life stage, they shed their external exoskeleton and they also shed the beginning of their digestive system, the foregut. And so that's important because it means that immature insects cannot transmit Pierce's disease after they molt. The adults may be able to transmit it longer than immature insects. In addition, they're more mobile. So immature leafhoppers, sharpshooters, spittle bugs can't fly. And so they're gonna be really local within the vineyard. Adults can travel larger distances and they're more of a concern over a larger area. And so this is also important when we start talking about monitoring. There's no latent period for infection for Pierce's disease from these vectors, meaning that they can potentially transmit the pathogen immediately after they acquire it from an infected host. And so transmission can be quite rapid after feeding, but again, if they're molting, so if they're immatures, 
going from one life stage to another, then they're going to have to reacquire the pathogen before they can transmit it again. Sarah did a really nice job of highlighting systemic versus local infection. So I actually pulled a couple slides out of my presentation while she was going, so we don't have to go over that point again. But as just to reiterate, as this relates to vector biology, those local infections occur near the tissue where the bacteria was initially introduced. And these may be present for a single growing season. And so you may have these local infections that occur just within a single growing season. It does not persist from year to year. And that's gonna depend on, as Sarah indicated, the timing of that infection during the year, and also to a certain extent, the location of that feeding activity. So if an infection occurs toward the distal end of a cane, you may have less likelihood of it making to the interior of the plant becoming a systemic infection if that infection occurs relatively late in the growing season. And so again, systemic infections require that bacteria to move and reproduce within the plant, and it's gonna persist over multiple growing seasons. So here's just a quick chart illustrating the relative efficiency of our different vector groups. So sharpshooters are essentially leafhoppers, but they, they're grouped into this separate category because they're bigger, larger, more robust than what you would typically think of as a leaf hopper. And those sharpshooters in North Carolina and other places are our most efficient vectors. And I'll show you some data relating to that. Next in efficiency are our leaf hopper groups. And I'm illustrating our most abundant and common leaf hopper species here. This is Graphocephala versuta. Unfortunately, there's not a great common name for these guys. So you're gonna hear me use that scientific name throughout these slides. And then spittle bugs are capable of transmitting Pierce's disease, but they are the least efficient, we believe, and they're also the more locally restricted in their movement. And so we don't think that these guys are necessarily an important target for path for vector management because we don't think managing them is going to decrease our, um, our infection rate in a really meaningful sense. So one key difference in vector biology between North Carolina and other parts of the United States where Pierce's disease is a significant concern is that the glassy wing sharpshooter or Homolytisca vitropenis is not the primary vector. So this is glassy wing down here in the lower right hand corner with the bright white spots on their wings. And this is work that was done by Turner Sutton, Sarah's predecessor, doing some surveys throughout the state of North Carolina to determine the location of glassy wing sharpshooter. And on these maps, any county that is highlighted red is a county where glassy wing sharpshooter was detected. Any county that is highlighted gray is a county that they looked in and did not find glassy wing sharpshooter. And then the white counties are counties that they did not sample in these surveys. So this was done um, from 2006 through 2009. We did some additional survey work in 2019 and um, essentially saw the same thing that they saw. We added Pequimans County uh, to the list, um, in addition to Curry Tech County over here in the far eastern part of the state, but we were active in a number of these gray counties in the northwestern part of the state, Surrey County, Yadkin County, other areas, and also confirmed that we did not find glassy wing sharpshooter in the counties we were looking in. So glassy wing sharpshooter is not our primary vector in North Carolina because we don't find it at most of the vineyards where we can find Pierce's disease. And even when we do find it, it's not very abundant. It's a relatively low density insect in our vineyards, even when present. And I'll show you some data on that from our 2019 survey. So as I said, we confirmed it in New Hanover and Pequimans County, in addition to the areas that were confirmed, that were previously confirmed by Turner. So that's not adding a whole lot of new information because those are areas in the eastern and the southeastern part of the state where we would expect them to be present, not areas in the farther west part of the state where we grow most of our susceptible grape varietals. All right, so now I'm just gonna walk you through um, some work that was done by a graduate student in Turner's lab, Ashley Myers. Um, so this is work that she conducted for her thesis research. And what I'm showing you here are trap abundances of different vector species um, as monitored by Ashley over the course of two years. And then over on the left, I'm showing you the 
degree of samples that were collected that had detectable bacteria in them for Pierce's disease, that's Xylella fastidiosa bacteria, and as well as the percent attempted successful transmission in some greenhouse studies that Ashley conducted. The red line on this figure and all other figures indicates that cutoff point that Sarah illustrated on the systemic infection timing figure where infection was less likely to go systemic after this time point. So this is roughly 150 days into the calendar year. And I'm gonna to continue to include that red line on all subsequent vector biology figures, just so you understand when the vectors are becoming active relative to when the pathogen, um, pathogen is likely to cause a systemic or significant infection. So this is Oncomatombia orbona. This is the broad-headed sharpshooter. That is the common name of this guy. They're similar in size to glassy wing sharpshooters, so they're large. They're about a little under an inch long. They have this bright blue wing and orange thorax, and they're pretty distinctive. So if you see them on the sticky trap, you'll know what they look like. Of the samples that Ashley Live collected in the field, 27% of those are positive for Pierce's disease. So it was present, this insect is probably moving it around, and they were the most efficient vector that she tested in the greenhouse. So 69% of greenhouse transmissions were successful. But I want you to highlight that in both of the years that she worked, their peak populations were occurring for the most part after the period of significant systemic infection risk occurred. So note that on subsequent figures as well. So this is Graphocephala versuta. As I said, we don't have a great common name for these guys. Some folks call them the versute leaf hopper. I don't know that that's any easier than the scientific name, but if you want to stick that in the back of your head as well. Um, a similar degree of the Graphocephala that were collected in the field by Ashley were positive for Pierce's disease. That means they had the pathogen in them, but when she attempted greenhouse transmission of the pathogen by these insects, they weren't very efficient at it. So 5% of the attempted transmissions were successful. Keep this in mind though, so I want you to note the axis on this figure, and I'll show you this in our 2019 data as well. Her max was nearly 200, was over 240 Graphocephala versuta per week uh, in one of the years, compared to a maximum of about 22 Oncomatopia or Bona. And so even though they're not very effective at transmitting Pierce's disease, they're about 10 times more abundant than the more efficient vector. So that's why we're more concerned about them. But as again, you can see their peak activity is occurring after those periods of time when we would expect the most risk for systemic infection developing. And then finally, this Paracephalus species, this is a little frog hopper, another species of um, hopping uh, xylem feeding insects. And there's less that we know about these guys. 33%, um, again, about a third of what Ashley collected were, were positive for harboring the bacteria in their body. But she was unable to do transmission efficiency work with these guys. And so we don't understand how good their transmission efficiency is. They're also harder to identify and distinguish in the field than the other two species, which are very easy to identify in the field. Um, and this is also one where in the second year that Ashley was doing her monitoring work, she caught more of them in that riskier time period than those other two vectors. And so it's one we have on our radar and we wanna make sure we're paying attention to, but we know less about it than we do about the other two leafhopper species. All right, so now I'm gonna give you a summary of what we saw last year in uh, 2019. So this is work that was conducted across the state. We worked in four vinifera vineyards, four muscadine vineyards. I'll show you data for both of these. And we looked at um, Pierce's disease vectors. We also looked at three other species of insects that were of concern in these vineyard surveys, but I'm just gonna focus on the Pierce's disease vectors here. We have weekly monitoring reports posted on the grape portal through the, um, extension portal system at NC State. I will put that link in the chat box when we're done so you can pull up the actual data that I'll be showing you as well. So this is what we did. We used a yellow sticky trap. I really like these Trace AM unbaited yellow sticky traps. Um, the color is the attractive thing. Yellow is attractive to these leaf hopping insects. We don't have another good attractant that can pull them in. So unfortunately we can't use things like pheromones for leafhoppers like we might be able to use for some other types of insects. 
These traps can be reused as long as they remain sticky. Um, once they're no longer tacky, you have to discard them and switch to a new type of trap. And then we recorded the main vector species. So we looked at that Oncomatopia, that broad-headed sharpshooter, Brachycephala, Paracephalus, and then glassy wing sharpshooter when they were detected. And then we also recorded any other leafhoppers and spittlebug-like species and identified them um, down to species. And this is also what we would ask a grower to do if they were monitoring for vectors in their vineyard. And we'll talk why, about why vector monitoring might be helpful when we get moved toward management. All right, so first I'm gonna show you our muscadine vineyards and I'm gonna walk you through again what I'm showing you on this figure. I've got our location of the vineyard on the left hand side of the screen. So that green dot indicates where the vineyard was located. I have the spray regime for these vineyards indicated on each figure. And then I have the total number of vector species indicated by the black line with no, no marking on it. So that indicates your total number of vectors that were present. And as you'll note on this and all subsequent figures, that Graphocephala versuta line, the orange line with the orange triangles on it, is basically the same as our total vector line. Um, so we'll, we'll tease this out a little bit more as we go through again. Um, but basically Graphocephala versuta is what is driving our vector life cycle here. And so again, these are muscadine vineyards. These are low risk for Pierce's disease infections. And as you can see, most of our vector activity is occurring later and that high risk susceptibility period for infection as far as systemic um, infections go. And I'm showing you basically the first of June is where this red line is falling out. Moving on to our vinifera vineyards. So again, you can see where the vineyards are located over here on the left. And then you can see the spray regime relative to each vineyard. And you can see that in three of our four vinifera vineyards, our vector activity was a little, was again later. But in this one Wilkes County vineyard, we did have some vector activity occurring earlier in the growing season during the periods of time where uh, systemic infection risk is higher. As I illustrated, Graphocephala versuta remains our most abundant vector and it really drives our total vector abundance if we're looking at the totals of all of these different species. In most cases, our peak activity occurred after highest, our highest infection risk period and so we would be less concerned about management in those contexts. And those populations differed both across locations and relative to the pesticide use practices that were being implemented at those different vineyards. But what about if we take this guy, Graphocephala, out of the mix and look at the, the activity of those less abundant but more efficient vectors? And so we observed three different sharpshooter species. We observed some glassy wing, as I'll show you on following slides. We observed that broad-headed sharpshooter. We also found this sharpshooter present, the black and white sharpshooter. It's a different species. We don't know the efficiency of these guys uh, for Pierce's disease, so they haven't been as well studied, but it's reasonable to assume that they can probably transmit it along with our other sharpshooter species. We also found a different Graphocephala species primarily at our eastern location. So this is Graphocephala cosinia, and they are red and blue instead of green and orange. Um, that's their biggest distinction if you're looking at them with the naked eye. They're typically more abundant in our eastern North Carolina locations than in our western locations. So these are those same figures, but now I have pulled out our Graphocephala species and I'm just showing you our sharpshooters and then that other different Graphocephala species that were present. Um, so again, here are our muscadine vineyards. And you can see when we pull out our Graphocephala versuta, we do have some sharpshooter activity shifting over into this higher risk period at a couple of our muscadine locations. Similarly, at our vinifera locations, when we pull out that Graphocephala activity and we just look at our sharpshooters, which are much lower, again, about tenfold less in abundance than our Graphocephala species, we do see some activity at a number of our vinifera vineyards bleeding out into that higher risk period. And so it's, it's useful to look at these in aggregate, but also to look at them as individual species and see what that activity looks like. So here's some, some conclusions about what we know about our vector biology so far. 
Our most abundant vector, that Graphocephala versuta, appears to be active after our highest risk period in many cases. But our more efficient vectors may be active during that highest risk period, but are present in much lower densities. And glass seawing sharpshooter is very uncommon in Western North Carolina. So let me just go back to that slide very quick and point out that glassy wing is our purple line. So we found them at our Rowan County location. We did not find them at our Wilkes County location, our Surrey County location, and we did find them at our Curry Tuck location. And so two of our Western locations remain still unlikely places where we'd find glassy wing sharpshooters. So that's really not the vector we're concerned about. All right, so let's talk about our vector management tools now. What tools are available to you guys? There's two suites of insect management strategies we can talk about. And so here, this is a really nice figure from a, a large review paper looking at Pierce's disease management. And we're here, we're talking about control of insect vectors circled in the red circle over here. And those consist of soil applied insecticides and foliar applied insecticides or protectants. That's basically the two categories we have. And we're basically talking about prophylactic preventative strategies here because we need to take action against these vectors before the pathogen is systemically transmitted to the, the grapevine. So for soil applied insecticides, the registered materials we have available to us, and you can see a lot more information about the use of these materials, rates, application timings, and uh, safety requirements in our bunch group spray guide, which is linked down here on the bottom through the Small Fruits, Southern Region Small Fruits Consortium. But our registered materials included Meyer Pro, active ingredient imidacloprid, venom, dinotefran, and other materials as well, belay, and then clothianidin is the active ingredient there. You'll note that all of these soil applied insecticides have the same IRAC or insecticide resistance action committee code after them. That means they all have the same mode of action they all work in a fairly similar fashion. So this last, this next thing I'm going to tell you, please take this with a grain of salt, but I think it's useful for contextualizing what's, what may happen in the Southeast. But work conducted in California suggested that imidacloprid treatments may take up to, day, up to eight days to reach the target concentrations in grapes that they are trying to hit for Pierce's disease suppression. But under California conditions, those target concentrations then persisted for essentially the whole growing season and certainly for that high risk period. And so the suggestion there is you could potentially one shot with a systemic application your Pierce's disease management. This is in a system where they are relying on irrigation for their water, not rainfall. So the movement and uptake of the soil applied insecticide is going to be different in our conditions than theirs. Um, and this is work we're actively interested in teasing out here in North Carolina. For foliar materials, we have a suite of registered foliar materials, which include foliar applications of those same products or products that contain those same active ingredients. So there's those IRAC 4A materials again, um, and with the addition of a sale, which is a different 4A material containing acetamifrid. There's also pyrethroid insecticides. These are our IRAC 3s, which are broad spectrum insecticides that do have activity against our Pierce's disease vectors. Then we have materials including Surround, which is a kale and clay product. It's a protectant that deters leafhopper feeding. Malathion and Seven, which are other broad spectrum materials, organophosphates or carbamates respectively. So we have a bit of a narrower spectrum material with our group fours, which are gonna have somewhat more local persistency. And then we have a suite of broad spectrum materials. And I have stars next to both surround and then our, two, our OPs and our carbamate materials, because I would generally not recommend these for use in grapes in North Carolina. Surround is a really great product. It can really suppress Pierce's disease transmission, but you need to coach the plant thoroughly with the product. And that can be a tricky application strategy. All right, so let's talk about soil versus foliar, which is a, a more advisable strategy. And this is, at, I think in North Carolina, still somewhat of an open research question in my opinion. Um, so the pros of a soil application are that a single application provides a very long-term activity. The cons are it's gonna be most effective through your drip irrigation. So if you don't have drip irrigation available, it's going to be a trickier material to put out 
It also might not always be needed because you might be in a year where you're at a lower risk or you might be in a year where your vectors don't occur during that high risk activity period. And so you might be putting it out and not really need that application. So that is incurring additional cost and potential non-target effects. Um, also because this material is being taken up by the plant, that potential exposure to non-target organisms is of a longer duration in some cases. So your pros of your foliar application, you can time those to pest presence. To be honest, that's also a con because that means you have to time them to pest presence, which requires you to be monitoring for vectors. Um, and that can be tricky. And so that requires scouting and reapplications will likely be needed when your pest pressure is high because these foliar applications are not likely not going to provide suppression for more than one or two weeks at the most. And there's gonna be greater non-target exposure when those applications are made because you're spraying the entire vineyard as opposed to just making a soil application. And so things that don't feed on the plants like our predatory insects are gonna be exposed to a foliar application where they wouldn't be exposed to a soil application. So, as I said, this is somewhat of an open research question here in North Carolina because the relative importance of these two different vector management strategies remains unclear in our system. Um, so we were hoping to compare the reduction in systemic disease from soil treatments to foliar treatments in North Carolina in 2020. Um, this has not been conducted yet because we hypothesized that in most years, a soil treatment was probably gonna get you most of the way that you need to be and in most of our moderate risk vineyards, and that those foliar treatments may not provide a whole lot of additional benefit. Um, and we have some, some big pros, I think, in the context of using these soil treatments for Pierce's disease suppression. So some general management recommendations. Um, we should expect the systemic infections are gonna be worse following warm winters in years where we don't get that chilling that suppresses and essentially winter cures vines. In our high risk areas, so that's you know, like our vinifera vineyard out in Curry Tech County in Eastern North Carolina, systemic insecticides applied prior to bud break are gonna provide long-term feeding suppression and therefore reduction in um, pathogen movement. In those high risk areas, you can also still follow up with foliar applications if you need to. So if you're in a very high risk area, you would continue to do that through midsummer after you have passed that high risk infection period. And then you wanna scout those systemic vines, symptomatic vines in the fall, flag, sample, and then revisit the following year to determine if those infections are recurring. And again, you can find more information about using those insecticides in our bunch grape IPM guide. So we had hoped to do this comparison work between soil applied applications and foliar applications in 2020. Unfortunately, the critical period for when those applications were supposed to go out occurred right when all of our statewide lockdowns uh, and quarantines occurred as well. And so we weren't able to be out in the field during that time period. So that has been shifted to a 2021 goal. But in the interest of moving our technology for managing Pierce's disease forward, we're taking advantage of this opportunity to develop some remote trapping tools, um, specifically powered by machine learning to identify and track our vector species. And so we thought of this um, because we think that vector monitoring and identification is a, a, a fairly difficult barrier for some growers to timing effective foliar applications if that's the management strategy they want to use. So we're partnering with a company called TrapView that has a presence in RTP and we're evaluating their remote trapping system for our key vectors, focusing first on Graphocephala and then on our broad-headed sharpshooter in three Western North Carolina vineyards. And this is just a photo um, from their website, what that trap looks like. We're also evaluating the same, similar set of tools for grape root borer, but that's not germane to our topic for today. Uh, so these were set up last week. We're actually going to check in on them this afternoon for the first time. So here are our grape root border paired traps in the orange box. Here's our standard bucket trap that we're comparing our remote trap to up here. And then here's our yellow sticky trap in the left in the yellow box compared to our standard yellow sticky trap. And we're going to be comparing the ability of these traps to remotely and hopefully independently identify our vector species to a manual trap that we go ahead and hand identify everything. Um, so Aurora Tennyson in my lab is managing this project through the end of this month. 
And we're hoping that we can train these systems to provide a more reliable identification of our Pierce's disease vectors and hopefully enable some better timing if growers choose to use foliar insecticides with a lower barrier in terms of insect ID expertise. Um, I also wanted to point out uh, in the absence of being out in the field as much as we would normally be, we have updated a whole bunch of fact sheets for our grape insect pests. Um, here's a link to those new fact sheets, including one for Pierce's disease vectors, uh, focusing on identifying those vectors and those management recommendations, essentially the material I talked about today. Um, I will pop this link into the chat box as well as we um, wrap up and go to questions. And that's all I had for this morning. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop my share and then take any questions that the group has. Um, <clears throat> yeah, thank you, Hannah. Um, so there are a couple questions, um, one in the general chat box. Um, someone asked where um, Pierce's disease bacteria originally occurs. I'm not sure. If and so I'm assuming that question is asking about um, where in what other plants does it naturally occur. And so as I mentioned at the beginning of the, the slides that I went through, there's over 90 different known plant house that includes annual plants, weedy plants in many cases, as well as woody perennials. And so the pathogen that's moving into your grapevines is coming either from non-crop weedy hosts, perhaps present in the vineyard or in the surrounding areas. It could also be coming from wild grapevines out in surrounding woody areas, but it's present in a whole lot of different plant hosts out in the environment. There is some difference in bacterial strains that infects one species of plant versus another, but we think most of the pathogen that's moving into grapes in North Carolina is coming from our annual weeds and also our non-crop grapes that might be present in the environment. So that's where the bacteria is occurring out in nature, independent of existing in a vineyard. Sweet, thank you. Um, there is one question that was asked earlier that Mark answered, but I'll just read it out loud so that everyone, if they haven't seen the chat box, um, can get that info. So someone asked, have you seen pierces in any of the far western counties in North Carolina? Um, which Mark responded, yeah, we found pierces disease in Henderson County last year for the first time. Um, so that's just in case anyone didn't see that in the chat. And then we have one more question um, from Kyle Friedman. If the infection is local, has the threshold of diseased areas been determined that won't impact fruit production? Um, in other words, can the vines afford to have some diseased areas without negatively impacting yields, or not so much since it's a xylellobacterium and spreads quickly? Yeah, so Sarah can probably jump on the, in on this as well. Um, you, pro you don't want to let diseased vines persist in your vineyard. Um, there's no value to keeping that diseased vine because it's eventually going, if it's systemically infected, it's eventually going to become non-productive and die. Um, and it's going to serve as a direct source of inoculum within your vineyard, as opposed to perhaps these indirect sources of our, in, our um, annual weeds or our grapes that are outside the vineyard. So there's really no benefit into keeping an area of local infection if it's truly systemically infected. I would make sure that it's a systemic infection and not a non-persistent single year infection before removing those vines. So give it until the following midsummer before you make that call. Um, but there's, there's no benefit to keeping a small area of infected planting and hoping that it's going to get better because it, it's not going to get better. It's just going to serve as a source. That sounds good to me, Hannah. Yeah. And I'm going to go ahead and drop the links that I had in my presentation into the chat box so you all can get those and copy them if you want. Um, but I think I'm ready to go ahead and move on to the next section. All right, thanks. Um, I just want to follow up on the last question too. Um, uh, so that also depends a little bit on the cultivar. If you if you have if you see disease symptoms, which doesn't mean that the cultivar doesn't carry the pathogen sometimes, also and can and so for example, muscadines can carry the pathogen, but don't show disease symptoms. So you always have to be a little bit careful. So if, I, I would I would second that and would say if you if you have plants that are 
that are diseased, there is no reason to like keep them in the vineyard for a long time, especially if it comes back into the systemic. All right. Um, thanks, Anna. And um, I'm going to share my screen now. Everybody see that? All right. So I hope everybody can see this. Um, uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about cultivars and the management methods a little, and, and, and what's happening in the vineyard um, in the next 30 minutes. Um, and uh, okay. And um, here's what, what, so this is what I'm going to cover over the next 30 minutes. Um, what are the factors that impact impacting piercing this? Hannah and, and, and Sarah already talked about this. I just want to give like a broad overview again. Um, and then we will talk uh, a lot about cultivars, especially about piercing disease resistant or tolerant cultivars. And then also about management methods in the vineyard, what you can do in terms of pruning and, and uh, applying insecticides with a young vineyard versus uh, with a non-bearing versus a bearing vineyard. And then a little bit on the identification and buying removal as well. So this is uh, 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 from, a, from a, a recent publication from, from Kane Hickey, who's now in Pennsylvania, but uh, uh, it's still from the says Georgia Times. And I think this illustrates very well how complex the whole disease symptoms and the factors which impact in the development of Pierce's disease in the vineyard are. And we really have several factors here, five, which, which are environmental, uh, how active your vector populations are, what kind of vectors are there. That's uh, what, what Hannah talked about. Um, how susceptible your grape cultivars are. Um, and also how long your, 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 um, your vines are exposed to vectors and to the bacteria and whether or not the bacteria is present in the environment or not. So, so it's a very complex uh, system. And if you look at those, we have basically five vectors that can impact the development of Pierce's disease. First of all, the bacterium has to be present, which is uh, in, most, in, in most environments in, in North Carolina the case. We can assume that. And, uh, and also there must, have, there must be an active insect vector population. It's very, it's very important to have uh, uh, vectors that can transmit the, the, the pathogen. Again, there are a lot of different vectors out there and, um, and, and the activity changes from year to year. So that's really hard to assess uh, from a vineyard management point of view. Um, and then the grape cultivars have to be success susceptible. Grapes must be exposed to the, ve the vectors and bacteria, and then the environment must be conductive to the survival of the bacterium as well. And uh, so I want to talk about the fifth factor first, because that's uh, what, we, what we see in North Carolina over the last couple of years in terms of Pierce's disease is, um, is uh, uh, note uh, worth noting. Um, so this is, I think everybody saw that graph. Uh, I think we showed it today too at some point. So this is a relatively old. It's from uh, Turner Sutton's work about the whole Southeast. And basically it shows uh, the lines of where Pierce's, Pierce's disease was present uh, over the Southeast. Everything East of a red line is a high risk area. And, um, but that, as we already established in the last two talks, has changed a lot uh, over the last couple of years. Um, we, for, we, we found first positive samples in the vineyard in Hendersonville in 2019. And uh, we scoured it this year and then we already see some symptoms coming back. We're not sure if it's Pierce's disease or not. Again, we established that too. We, got, we wait before we test, but we saw see them on the same wines again. So, um, and, while, and we had a very warm and mild winter and that usually leads to higher bacterial survival rates in, uh, as well. And that is just not one year, a one year trend. That, that is a, a several decade trend already in, in, in the Southeast, as you, can, as you can see here. Um, we have uh, much warmer nights uh, with minimum temperatures above 75 degrees uh, Fahrenheit um, over the last couple of, of decades, really. That's a very clear trend from the 1980s to 2010. So the weather is getting warmer in North Carolina. Every spot here on, on this map is basically a weather station. And, um, 
and uh, we also have uh, more freeze-free seasons. So freeze is not frost. What we had in May and in April was a frosty wind, and those probably come get will get more in the future. We don't know that, but freeze freezes are, are, are days where where we have temperature below freezing, and those days are important for Pierce's disease survival. And we do not have a lot of the, so those days are getting more rare also over the last 20 years or something so that's also a trend which you can see over since the 90s and uh, again every dot here is a weather station and if you see like a red reddish dot that means that you had less freeze freeze uh, days uh, over the last couple of uh, decades in those in those areas so we're looking at the trend we basically have warmer weather uh, when we have to deal with warmer weather in vineyards over the last, last couple of years. That is especially important for those who plant a vineyard right now because they're going to have to think about what are we going to do in the next 10 or 20 years um, in terms of Pierce's disease. And, um, and if we really look at this from a long-term perspective, so we're not talking just about the next 2030 or 2040, which is if you plant a vineyard today, that's when your vineyard should be producing. Um, uh, should be, uh, we, we're talking, let's say we're talking about 2050 or 2070, um, we will see that uh, basically well, one prediction says that the USDA plant hardness zones will shift way up north. Uh, and, and in a couple of those scenarios, we see that, that uh, in North Carolina and also in the rest of the Southeast, uh, we will shifting our hardiness zones, which are right now around 7B or 8A, into the nine range for most of for most of North Carolina, which then, again, from a from a Pierce's disease point of view, will probably lead to more vector or other vectors which moving in into our into our region as well. So we always have to think about this if we plan a vineyard and if we plant plants right now because it's a per annual long term cropping system. We have to make sure that in twenty or thirty years that vineyard is still. Um, uh, 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 produces the grapes. And um, so we really have to keep that in mind. So, and that brings us to cultivars. And there are several challenges for the futures, for the future. Um, we really have to think about Pierce's disease resistant or tolerant cultivars more than we have in the past in North Carolina. Um, also, we need to look at heat and disease tolerant uh, cultivars and the ability to ripen in the climate with less cool nights, which is a ripening problem really. Also, if we have a lot of nights which are above 75 degree Fahrenheit. So cultivar choice is not just a, a wine style choice, it's also a Pierce's disease management tool. And um, so, and most of the cultivars which are planted right now in North Carolina, which is uh, the, the, the majority is, is, uh, is uh, Avonifera grapes, is Chardonnay, Merlot, Cap Franc, are uh, susceptible, highly susceptible to Pierce's disease. Others are less susceptible, but in high risk areas, we still see a lot of symptoms on those. So I would like to talk a little bit more about tolerant and resistant cultivars now as, a, as to think about it as a choice. They're not grown as much in North Carolina. Um, but in the, uh, I, I feel that the cultivar choice in North Carolina is a very complex decision and does not only has to do with the wine style you want to do, or with the cus what the customers like, but also with environment and especially with Pierce's disease pressure in your area. And um, there are plenty of, there are some Pierce's disease resistant cultivars out there. Uh, I first go over the red cultivars and then I will go over the white cultivars. Um, and one is Black Spanish or Le Noir, which is used a lot in, in Texas, in the South, and in the, in the high country there. And, uh, and it is uh, one of the most grown Pierce's disease resistant cultivars, red Pierce's disease resistant cultivars. It has high tannins, but also very high acidity, which makes it very hard for certain wine styles. Um, and it's a Berenthalia vinifera, so it has an American heritage in it. A lot of those wines which I'm gonna, gonna, gonna uh, show you do have American heritage in it, but it is something which, which uh, is grown a lot in Texas and, um, and it's worth trying. And other red cultivar, which um, is Pierce's disease resistance, is uh, Lomanto, which is also grown 
a little bit on small commercial acreage in South Te Texas. It's a hybrid with also some, with like a Spanish vinifera in the background. Um, also worth a test. Um, right? We have no idea how this, how this, how Lumento will perform in, in North Carolina. We, I, I, don't, I don't think we have a large, or I don't think we have any acreage for Lumento in North Carolina at the moment. Um, but it is a Pierce's disease resistant cultivar. Um, Norton is also a Pierce's disease resistant cultivar. Um, we have larger acreage in Georgia. We also have large acreage in Virginia, and we have in the western part of North Carolina. We have a lot of Norton grown. Norton is a uh, is is not a real cultivar. It was found in the wild and it's basically grown as uh, uh, in commercial settings, um, and then there's a Vitis estivalis um, um, heritage. And then, of course, and I'm only going to mention it once today. Um, muscadines do show uh, quite a lot of tolerance and resistance against um, against Pierce's disease. Uh, uh, muscadines can uh, show Pierce's disease symptoms if they're really if they have very high titers, but that usually doesn't uh, lead to a systemic infection, and that usually also doesn't um, lead to any yield loss or any other um, dieback or die off of, of the grapes. Um, uh, but muscadines are certainly uh, one cultivar, uh, certainly one, one, one uh, areas of vines which might be interesting in the future as, as, um, as uh, in, in high risk Pierce's disease areas. Um, also Petit Serrat or Durif is a major producer in California as most known and also in Israel. Um, is, is uh, considered to be Pierce's disease uh, tolerant. Um, the problem with this one is it's, it's very, it has very tight clusters, which is not a good idea in North Carolina, and, um, and it, but it also has very high tannins. And then uh, for the fresh market, uh, there is a new cultivar out from uh, Arkansas, Texas. I don't think it is a, a very well suited for wine production. I just wanted to, to um, show it here. It's called Victoria Red. Um, and that's a vinifera and a French American hybrid background here. So, so now um, there are some UC Davis cultivars out, which are released this year, the first time they were they were uh, uh, they were um, available to some research uh, research projects before that, but they were released in 2020. And I want to introduce those a little bit more. Um, there's Camina Noir, which is uh, released by Andy Walker's breeding program. Um, in 2020, and that has very large berries and very loose clusters, which makes it very suitable for our climate to grow. Um, it is, but it's also a very early bud breaking cultivar. But there are management strategies to manage early bud breaking cultivars in North Carolina. So we really would, should have a look at this. Um, this one, they don't release the whole genetics because the pen, patent is still pending, but we know it's 50% Petit Serra and 25% caps off. And we also know that the Pierce disease resistance comes from with this Arizonica. In all those cultivars, the Pierce's disease resistance is coming from with this Arizonica. So Andy Walker's group, they, they, they identify genes which are um, involved in Pierce's disease resistance and then bred those cultivars based but with those tools which they developed early on. Um, uh, so there are three red cultivars which are which are from from the UC Davis breeding program, which were released this year. Um, there's Paciente Noir. This is the second one, which uh, uh, is a medium-sized berry and has filled clusters. So in my opinion, I think that is not a, not not the best cultivar to try here because of the tight cluster space. Um, but it blooms later, and it has also late ripening. And there's a lot of synfandel in it. So the background here is 50% synfandel, 25% petit serra, and 12.5% caps off. And again, the Pierce disease resistance is coming from Vitis Arizonica. So all of those grapes, they do have 97 or more percent vinifera background. So they're almost a pure vinifera. And then this is one which I think would be the most suitable for our climate based on what I know about the cultivar so far. Um, this is Errante Noir, 
uh, that seems to be very highly resistant to Pierce's disease. Uh, they did very extensive studies on this one in, in, in California over the last five or six years. Um, has very large berries and loose clusters, which is always good for our climate. Um, and it seems to be very productive in California. And it's a dark red purple color, has very complex fruit aromas and high quality tannins. So I, that, that, this is probably out of those three red cultivars, this is the one which I think is, uh, is, is the one which, which is most suitable for our climate based on what I know when I look at the description of, of, of the cultivars. It has a 50% Silvana background and 12.5% caps off and a couple of others, uh, others in there as well. Again, uh, more than 97% in total of vinifera background. So those are the, the, uh, the red cult cultivars uh, as an overview of, of the most common Pierce's disease resistant cultivars. There are plenty of more out there, often with questionable um, quality um, uh, 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 characteristics. So, so we are. I, I'm looking at those which are basically grown the most, or which are more, which are in the case of the UC Davis cultivars, the most, um, uh, 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 the one which which show which show the most prospect for our for our climate here. Um, out of all Pierce's disease resistant cultivars which are grown so far in America, Blanc du Bois, which is a white cultivar, is probably the most grown. Um, again, in South Texas and also in Florida, um, is a high producer. It has very loose clusters. Um, and again, it's a mix with vinifera and uh, several other American cultivars in the heritage. Chardonnay, which is, uh, we have some acreage of Chardonnay, shows, high, shows also high Pierce disease tolerance. Um, could be a substitute for Chardonnay. Um, it's a late ripening. Uh, we have it commercially in, 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 uh, in North Carolina and Georgia a little bit. And it's, a, it's basically a heritage of Seval, Seval and Chardonnay and um, can make a really good wine out of this. Um, Chardonnay, I think, is one of the cultivars which, which, um, which uh, shows higher precious disease resistance and, and should be considered as, as one strategy to, to mitigate precious disease, in, a long-term strategy to mitigate precious disease in, in vineyards. And then we also have uh, two cultivars which are, which are um, released by the UC Davis breeding program. That's Ambulo Blanc. That's, an, uh, that's uh, also high resist, uh, high resist to Pierce's disease. Both of those white cultivars, which I'm gonna show you right now, they're both early butt breaking. So they're both gonna be a problem at, in, in some, in, at some times in, in, in North Carolina. Um, because as we know this year, um, it's very, it, it, there's, we will have frost, frost events, not every year, but there will be frost events, frequent frost events, and, and, uh, and the early butt breaking cultivars are always a problem in frequent frost events. So, and both of those white PD cultivars are early butt breaking. Um, this one is very high, it's highly productive. Again, a lot of caps off in it. And uh, so all of those cultivars have caps off in it. All, all five UC Davis cultivars have a caps off background. And, um, and also Chardonnay and, and Carnage, and then the rest of the genetics is not released so far. The same with the, the Caminante Blanc, um, also early butt breaking, uh, also a high producer. The clusters are a little bit smaller, but they're both relatively, relatively loose. Abulo Blanc has a little bit tighter clusters than Caminante Blanc. And the heritage is very similar to both of both of those. Um, so um, we are going to try to test those cultivars in North Carolina um, next year for the first time in, in a test in a commercial vineyard in, 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 in the Atkin Valley. Um, what I always say is that if you want to try cultivars, um, if you want to try a new cultivar at your specific location, it's such a complex system between the Pierce's disease pressure and the climate you have and the microclimate you have in your specific location. You should try not a large acreage in the very beginning unless you're very safe and you know those cultivars grow and those, this is what you want to do from, uh, in terms of Weinstein. Um, if you don't, I would try a small acreage, see how it works and then transition into a, long, into a larger acreage 
Um, and if it doesn't work, you just take out the plants and replant it with something which you, which you think would work better. Because even if we do a cultivar trial in, in, in the Atkin Valley, that doesn't mean that what we find in that specific location will work everywhere in North Carolina. Our climate is way too diverse for that. And um, so, but we will, tr we will try to get our hands at the UC Davis cultivars. Um, and I found out, and putting together a list of nurseries at the moment, uh, I found out that Wonderful can deliver those, cu those cultivars, but you probably have to call them. They're not on the list, but I know vineyards who got their material from Wonderful. So, so you, uh, if, you, if you are interested in UC Davis cultivars, that's at the moment all I can tell you, but I'm trying to put a bigger list together and put that into our grape portal as well over the next coming weeks. Um, but those, there are limited cultivars available for 2021. There will be more for 2022. But, um, but um, they were re just released this year, so there are only a few nurseries who have them at the moment. Um, but again, my recommendation is if you, if you want to try those cultivars and you're not sure about how they grow and if they work for you, just try them on a small acreage before you put in like large acreage and then you figure out it doesn't work for you. Or you, you will have other disease problems which, 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 uh, which we were not aware of before in some of those cultivars. Because in our climate, we don't know how those cultivars will perform in our climate in terms of ripening, in terms of disease um, susceptibility for other things like sour root, for example. Um, yeah, so this picture, I took this picture, Sarah, actually, and this is just, um, I just want to go again a little bit about identification of Pierce's disease. So again, as we all, as we said before, um, if you have to, you, you're going to have to identify your Pierce's disease problems in your vineyard. Um, and you usually, you see symptoms later in the season. So now it's a little bit too early still to, to, to look, at, uh, look at, at symptoms, especially after all the frost damage we got. You're probably going to have to wait a little bit longer this year than you usually have to wait um, uh, in a normal year. And this is just a typical sign. This is, if, if your wine looks like this, you have like a lot of uh, uh, leaves like this, you have, you, uh, which are crispy. You have... Um, a lot of matchsticks, and I'm going to show you that in a second again, a little bit more. Uh, you know, you, you have shriveled fruit on the wine. That is a typical sign for Pierce's disease, infected grape wine. Um, so we went over this a little bit. White cultivars look a little bit different than red cultivars in their, in their, in their um, symptoms. But we also, we have leaf necrosis with distinct red and brown ma margins. That's very distinct. If you look at this, you always have, a, you have always have like a, 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 a margin, and you always have leaf necrosis on um, uh, on the eye on one side of, of the margin. So that's a very distinct symptom. And other distinct symptom are those green islands, which you sometimes can see in in uh, otherwise lignified shoots, often on the primary shoot of a vine. Uh, again, later in the season, your, wine, your, your, your shoots are not lignified right now. You're going to have to wait until they're getting lignified later in the season to see those green islands anyways in the first place. And then one very distinct symptoms are the leaf plate abscissions, or which we call what we call matchsticks. Um, and you can see that as well later in the season, um, better than right now. So again, symptoms can be different from grape to grape and from, from, from wine to wine, from location to location. But often later in the season, you see one, two, or even all three of them. Uh, and then together with um, uh, shriveled fruit, you can, you, 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 will probably, you will probably look at Pierce's disease infected wines. As Sarah pointed out, there is a lot of confusion with trunk diseases and, uh, and, and uh, viruses, grape viruses, or even, even if, you, if your wine has um, uh, acrobaterium, so if it has a crown gall, symptoms can be similar so it's always important to test your wines before you make decisions on pierce's disease especially on wine removal um, and so those testing goes through the plant disease and insect clinic this is how the website looks um, if you're a new user user you're going to have to sign up as a new user otherwise you just click here on how to submit a sample and then it walks you through this online sheet. If you do have questions about how to submit a sample or filling out the online sheet, please ask either your uh, extension agent, I, I, especially in, in Yadkin County, Surrey, and, and in Wilkes, we have very good extension agents that work a lot with the industry there. And, and um, or you ask me, or you ask you know, anyone from NC State, we, we usually can help you with that. 
and um, and then uh, it's usually a fee-based system, but we can run those those molecular tests, which Sarah referred to. The titer has to be relatively high, so it, right now it's not the right time to submit samples. What I would do if you see symptoms in your vineyard, and I'm going to talk about scouting in a second, but if you see symptoms in the, in the vineyard, I would mark those wines and come back later in the season and see how those symptoms developed. And if you see more severe Pierce's disease symptoms, you would probably send a sample, but I would wait until latest, until the horizon before I would send samples because the titer has to go up for us to detect it. Um, as I said, contact your local agent or your specialist and submit photos and a physical sample. Uh, there's usually $20 fee, and, but we also have, we have the team working even during COVID, we're working at reduced hours. So don't send something on a Thursday, on a Friday, try to send it on Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday, and try to send it overnight. And, um, but we perform those high sensitive tests and usually what's happening is we get the sample and then they also contact all specialists, which, which in this case is Sarah, Hannah and I. And then uh, if we don't have an answer, which is, then, then we, will, we will start contacting people from other states as well. So there is, a, there is like a, a process in place, which if you send that sample, we basically look at those samples uh, going and going through a process. Um, so, um, and that leads me to the next part of, of the presentation, which is Pierce's disease management. Um, and we talked a little bit about this uh, already. And if we go back to the factors, um, we are talking mostly about uh, controlling of insect vector populations and, um, and the exposure of vectors and bacteria. So, so we're not talking about the cultivars because I already covered a little bit about the cultivars before and, and I take questions after this as well. Um, so there are five components to, to the, um, to the uh, to the pieces disease management, which are really important, which is scouting, scouting not for insects, but scouting for symptoms for, on the wine. Scouting for insects is very complicated, uh, as Hannah pointed out, because there are so many insects involved into, into uh, pieces disease transmission, but scouting for symptoms is extremely important. Testing the, your wines is also very important. Pruning strategies is always uh, important with, uh, to manage systemic diseases like pierces or like also like trunk diseases. Uh, and then vector control and removal of wines is also important. And, and we have to make like a really distinct decision between a young non-bearing vineyard, which I would recommend to treat it if you are in a high I should have put that in there, but if you're in a high Pierce's disease, high risk area, if you know your neighbors have Pierce's disease, if you know that your vineyard generally, like the other acreage, has a, has a high, there is a lot of Pierce's disease around, treat your young vineyard as would it be infected. So do an insecticide application, basically, just because you know you have the vectors and you have Pierce's disease in there anyways. Um, and do a very intensive scouting and testing, especially in the first two years of establishment. Um, and if you have see symptoms later in the season on those wines, I would not, I would not risk it to keep it in there for the next year. If it's a non-bearing young acreage, I would just take out the plant and replant it next year again. Uh, it's just not worth the effort to like go back and look at it again, and you know maybe prune, maybe it comes back, maybe it doesn't come back. It, it doesn't make any sense. If if they are infected and they they show severe symptoms and they're non-bearing, so they're young wines. It's, it's easier to take them out and replant them. Um, in a mature vineyard, where you have, uh, where, which you yield, again, frequent scouting and testing is highly important. And also, um, if you have confirmed cases, then you would apply vector control. And you, you also would have to mark those confirmed wines and remove the wines if only if there is systemic, so if it comes back to, to, to in year two. Um, and, and I just got a call this morning before, before the seminar started. The removal of the, the wine, so if you have to remove a wine and you want to replace it, remove it at the end of the harvest season and replace it in spring. So don't remove it now and then replace it two weeks later. That's just the wrong time to like 
to, to remove a wine at the wrong time to, to replant, basically. Um, so we really have to make those dis distinct decisions. So what's, what's the same for both scenarios is that the scouting for Pierce's disease symptoms should be, if you are not in the mountains, if you are in the Yadkin Valley or in any, any, anywhere not in the mountains, and you grow vinifera, you have a vinifera vineyard, your scouting should be a, a frequent activity in your vineyard, especially from now on into the later part of the season for Pierce's disease symptoms. Insect vectors, as, 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 as Hannah mentioned, I am not necessarily recommending to scout for them. I, some probably do with yellow sticky traps. Still, it's hard to identify those if you do not have an entomology background. So before you make any decisions and you really have sticky traps out there, um, talk to Hannah and, um, and uh, she will help you. Um, early symptoms can show after bloom. But again, they look very, can look very different and we're not sure if that is enough tighter to test. So severe symptoms usually show, look, show later in the season and that's when you would, would start testing. Um, but as we covered before, infection through vectors can actually occur very early. So what you do is basically, if you're, if you're starting to scout now, is you kind of lag a little bit behind because your infection already probably occurred. Um, but what you would do is later in the season, you would send your samples to the PDIC for testing to confirm Pierce's disease. That's very important because again, uh, the symptoms can resemble different, different, disease, uh, different, different other diseases. And if you're not very firm in scouting, you might confuse those. So it's really important to have at least a, 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 a test. And Sarah talked about it earlier, how to sample and where to send it and how to test it. So, um, so I'm not going to cover all that. Um, important is that if you have a confirmed case, you definitely need to mark those wines because you don't, you want to know if, if you come back, if, if that's, if that, uh, 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 infection comes back systematically the, the year later. Um, so as a general, uh, general remark, I, it's the scouting activity should be based off and every vineyard, vineyard management should do that no matter how much acreage you have. And it should be a systematic approach. It should be something which you should do on a frequent basis. Uh, and you should be able to say, and you, you should be able to scout and test for pierces diseases, trunk diseases, viruses. And if you're in a high root borer risk area, um, you also should look for root borer. So that should be a frequent activity in every vineyard, really. And because those are really big threats, if you do not take care of them, if you do not scout, you cannot react to them probably, and uh, and and that will you will be at an increased risk of losing wines uh, here in North Carolina. So, and in my opinion, the scouting system should have three components. You should have a field-based marking system where you flag the wines which you know are positive. In our case, for Pierce's disease, then you should have a hard copy record on, of that as well. So you should have like some sort of a paper system where you basically write down which wine was positive and, and you should have a computer based records as well, because you're going to scout those over several years and it makes a lot sense, a lot of sense to put that into like some sort of an Excel format or something. So that is the best case scenario. I feel that is what you should do for those four types of diseases or three types of diseases. If you do not have big, a lot of root borne. Um, in non-varying vineyards, if you see a lot of Pierce's disease, if you see a lot of symptoms and it's confirmed, my opinion is just remove it and replace it um, since you're not losing a lot of yield. Um, in mature vineyards, um, if you have uh, an infection and it, and, and it only appears on one shoot or a couple of shoots, mark those shoots and cut them out later, um, early and uh, after harvest. And um, I know it's very impractical, but it has been shown that, that if you clean your pruning tools between those, those, those uh, activities, that can also reduce the risk of, of, um, of uh, transmitting the virus, uh, the, the bacterium. And um, also, pruning wood out if you have a cane or if you have a, 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 a cordon which, which has a lot of in, infected uh, shoots on it, it might, you might be able to prune that out during the dormant season and retrain a new cordon 
for the next year that might reduce the risk uh, of a systemic infection. Um, however, if the symptoms come back the next year, you, at the same wine, and that's why it's so important that you, have a, that you will have a marking system. If the symptoms come back the next year at the same wine, you're going to have to remove and replace that wine. You can push it through the whole season. It doesn't, you know, if it's not severely damaged, but at the end of the harvest, it would be the latest time you, 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 set, you, you, you remove it, and then you would replace next spring with a new planting in the same area. Um, also very important, um, uh, on, on for for for, for uh, 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 Pierce's disease control is uh, control your host plants, which as as Hannah said, we have more than ninety host plants in in North Carolina, um, which means basically good weed control, and that is very very important, especially if you're in a high risk or even if you're a moderate risk area of Pierce's disease, you need to have very good weed control, which means keep your rose mode, keep everything around the vineyard mode and keep your herbicide strips under the wine. It's very important if you want to reduce your Pierce's disease pressure, that's one of, one of the most overlooked but very important tools to, um, to reduce basically the vector pressure um, in your vineyard. Um, and then Hannah pointed out soil applied systemic insecticides and foliar applications. Again, as she said, that's a research a question right now, a common practice at the moment is the early spring and the midsummer soil trench application. I second hand I hear that I think an early spring application is probably enough and would get you through where you need to be. Um, but we don't know that right now. That's that's a research question and and um, I, I and and um, Hannah touched on that uh, earlier today. Um, good resources are out there every year updated. Um, on, on all uh, berry crops, and special, uh, uh, including bunch grapes, uh, smallfruits.org. Um, if you click on IPM production guides, and then you will see the bunch grape, uh, you need click on the bunch grape production guides, you have a lot of really good recommendations on Pierce's disease management in there. It's free, it's a PDF, you can print it out. Um, I always recommend to look at that. It gives you rates of insecticides, when to apply it, when not to apply it, and which combination to apply it. So it's a very, very good resource. Um, for us to have and that's how it looks like this is this is the 2019 version i believe and then also on our grape portal you find a lot of information on hannah's research uh, and our team also put together a lot of resources on on uh, on uh, different diseases on bunch grapes um, and a big section of pierce's disease and we basically put together everything we found web uh, web uh, in the whole united states on pierce's disease management so it's definitely worth looking into this as well you find a lot of different um resources on pierce's on, on other diseases in, in this as well and then uh, just two links here and this I'm, I'm going to put those links into the chat box in a minute as to the uga um uh, publication which is which came recently out and then the UCA and R publication as well on Pierce's disease management. And um, that was it. I'm also over my time already. So um, if with this, I take questions. Hey, Mark, um, no questions have come in um, so far, but if anyone has any last minute questions, I encourage you to type one up. Um, other than that, All right. thanks for your presentation. Thank you. And you find everything on the Grape Portal, um, uh, including the recording of this video, in um, maybe in a day or so. All right. So um, thank you. Before everybody logs off, we need, your, we need everybody's um, pesticide uh, number, uh, license number and name again in the chat box and um, and Emma is gonna record that and we send that to Patty so that you get your pesticide license number all right thanks so there is a question from Chuck Blesson in the chat box about muscadine cultivars and susceptibility to PD. Um, since I'm talking, Carlos is one that'll show symptoms, um, but 
those symptoms don't necessarily translate into the same severity as for vinifera, but I'm not aware of um, other varietal uh, muscadine varieties other than Carlos that show symptoms. Yeah, I, I have one, I see it sometimes on Noble too, but Carlos for sure is, is, is one which shows it very, which can show it, but yeah, I agree. Hannah, do you want to send me your PDF as of the PowerPoint? And I, I'm going to put it on the portal later. Sure, I'll go ahead and share it with you. Thanks. So do we have all pesticide license numbers um, or is somebody who does not have put their license number in there? I'm still going through it. So you're still going through it, okay, all right. 